We are maybe, in my opinion, one of the most important sites in Egypt, the center for the worship of the sun god. This place called now Heliopolis, the Greek called it Heliopolis, mean the city of the sun. It was called by the ancient Egyptian Un, and it was connected with the 13 gnome of Lower Egypt. No one really can believe we're only 20 kilometers away from downtown Cairo. And we can see this important town that I will tell you the story of this town. The story that this is the place that all of us thought about creation. All of us can hear from this place the world was created. From this place we can have lots of knowledge about antiquities, about salvage archaeology. And today we are going to do another adventure. Adventure in archaeology. Scholars and scientists carried out their work in Heliopolis for many centuries. Their studies led to important scientific and cultural developments. This work greatly depended on people's knowledge of the laws of nature and the world they lived in. With time, a number of cults were born, including the Cult of the Sun. A magnificent temple was built in Heliopolis, which was dedicated solely to the Cult of the Sun. Unfortunately, nothing now remains of this building. However, we can get a good idea of what it was like by observing the Sun Temple in Abu Ghurab, which is located close to Abu Zir and not far from Cairo. Not much remains of this temple, based on the exact same model as Heliopolis, and built under Nuzeri's rule, one of the pharaohs from the 5th dynasty. However, it is the only one anywhere in Egypt of which any trace still remains. The cult of the sun existed even in pre dynastic period, more than 6,000 years ago. And the first temple that was established for the sun was in Dynasty One, about 5,000 years ago. And we are actually in a place that contained many temples uh, located uh, in the area and dedicated to the Ramasite period. Many Ramses, the second and the third and the fourth and the eleventh, they built temples here. This place, the priest is even divided the year to 12 months. Every month is 30 days. Every year is 365 days. In my opinion, Heliopolis built Egypt. The ancient Egyptians didn't know what the sun was exactly. However, they sensed that it was the source of life itself. This is why they venerated every one of its manifestations. And the god of the sun, Ra, was always the main divinity in their pantheon. He was the god of rebirth and was depicted in many ways. At dawn, he was Kepri, shaped like a beetle. During the day, he was Ra, portrayed as a man with a falcon's head crowned by a sun disk. Finally, at sunset, he was Atum, human in shape, with a double crown on his head. However, the ancient Egyptians didn't just study the sun. They knew exactly where the cardinal compass points were, for example. Khufu's pyramid is a perfect example. The four sides of the monument are closely aligned to the four cardinal compass points, with an error of less than a tenth of a degree. The Paris Observatory was built in the 1800s, and the aim was to align it to the cardinal points. However, its deviation is twice that of the Great Pyramid. Even though the tools they used were very limited, the ancient Egyptians already knew about the existence of five planets in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Mercury and Venus. They were also able to distinguish between a number of constellations, Cygnus, Ursa Major, Cassiopeia, Sirius and above all, Orion. We have been able to ascertain an outstanding correspondence between the position of the stars that form Orion's belt and the three great pyramids of Giza. 
it would seem that other pyramids actually correspond to other stars in the constellation. Just a coincidence? Or part of a message that the ancient Egyptians wanted to pass down? Over the centuries and dynasties, the cult of the sun became increasingly important, reaching its climax during the reign of one of the most controversial pharaohs in Egyptian history, Akhenaten. Akhenaten abolished the cult of the gods in favor of a single god, Aton, bringing about a complete religious and social revolution. Aton, the sole god and king, substituted the Theban sun theology, which worshipped Amun. The sun, first represented as a man with a falcon's head, was now identified by a disc. Rays shine out from this bright sphere, ending in stretched out hands that carry Ankh, the key to life, to mankind, and to all creation. But who was Akhenaten? And why has this figure been the source of so many contradictions over the centuries? It is fascinating to speculate about Akhenaten's personality. Was he a genius? Was he a madman? Was he a little of both? We don't really know, but he certainly was an innovator. His religion, and his art, as it reflects his religion, was certainly very original. Especially from the early part of his reign, Akhenaten and his family are shown in a very unusual way. They have very elongated faces, over-large jaws, swollen bellies, and spindly limbs. They look very strange to us. There's been a great deal of discussion about what these features mean. Are they a reflection of what Akhenaten really looked like? Do they perhaps reflect a congenital deformity of some sort? What drove Akhenaten to overturn the balance of a system? Was it a power struggle between religious castes or a visionary's plan? There was a, a real conflict between the king and the government body, government officials and the price of, of Amon, clearly speaking. Over this situation, uh, there was uh, an exaltation of uh, uh, royal authority uh, through the valorization of its divine appearances. The beautiful and powerful Nefertiti took on a prominent role during the reign of her husband Akhenaten. Her presence in official ceremonies, even in military ones, made way for suspicions that her role was as co-ruler. But surrounding this figure, there are many doubts, the foremost of which is connected with her disappearance. It seems more likely that uh, she did because there's no evidence uh, um, to stay disgrace. On the other side, uh, some scholars believe that Zmenkara, uh, a pharaoh ruling between Akhenaten and Tutankhamun, was Nefertiti herself, um, assuming a male character as uh, Queen Hatshepsut. She or he ruled along a brief period after the death of Akhenaten uh, with Meritaten in uh, official and ceremonial role of a great royal wife. Even though the pharaohs did not, unlike Akhenaten, make drastic or unpopular decisions, they were a very important part of ancient Egyptian religion. The pharaoh was the link between the human and the divine realms. As son of the sun god, he was the incarnation of God on earth. All communication between gods and men ultimately flowed through him. The religious importance of Heliopolis is linked to how the gods were actually created. The priests of the city, who were without a doubt the most important members of society, created the legend that the main divinities were born in the city of the sun itself. This is how the so-called Heliopolitan Ennead was born, consisting of the nine divinities who, according to local theories of cosmogony, created the world. The pharaonic civilization that we know about started from this place. The devil god in here made a party and he made a beautiful sarcophagus, invited Osiris, and Osiris sat in the sarcophagus, he closed it and put it in the ocean. This coffin became the pillar in the palace of the king of Biblos in Lebanon. Isis cried for her son and husband. From her tears 
made the river Nile. And she went to, the, to Biblos. She took the pillar with her magic. She returned Osiris to life. And she made love to him. And she had the Osiris, the son. Horus was born from the union between Isis and Osiris. The god with the falcon's head was conceived and brought up by Isis with the sole objective of avenging Osiris. When Horus became adult, he attacked Set, who reacted by pulling out one of his eyes. At the end of a cruel battle, Horus was the winner. His eye was recuperated by the god Toth, who purified it and replaced it in the socket. The Egyptian religion attributes a lot of magic power to Horus's eye, as for example that of protection from disease and of bringing man back to life. In the mummification rites, Horus's eye was placed above the incision where the embalmers had taken out the internal organs. The priests of Heliopolis believed that Horus, the god of the sky, could not be deemed first among the gods without Ra, god of the sun, and so they identified one with the other. They decided that the sun eye, right, belonged to Ra, and the moon eye, left, belonged to Horus. Although Horus is destined to become a king, the court of Heliopolis doesn't trust him. He is a very, very young god. Only after lots of trials, Horus um, will reach what he deserves the Euro, thanks to the magical arts of his mom, Isis, and the power of his father, Osiris. In fact, Osiris threatens um, the other gods with frightful disgraces in case they wouldn't allow his son, Horus, to become a king. One monument linked to the cult of the sun has over the centuries become the symbol of ancient Egyptian civilization, the obelisk. Symbol of the god of the sun, Ra, at the time of Akhenaten's religious reform, it was believed to be a ray of sun that had been turned to stone. The word obelisk comes from the Greek and is certainly not an Egyptian word as it was called Ben-Ben or Tekken in Egyptian and means small skewer. It is without a doubt the name given to this impressive monument by the Greeks and Romans, who satirically and humorously likened it to a small skewer on which the Egyptians roasted meat for their gods. Amongst the few remains of ancient Heliopolis, there is also an obelisk erected by Senesret I, second pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. The monument was erected around 1940 BC. At just over 20 meters in height, it is not particularly imposing. However, it has one feature that makes it unique. It is the most ancient obelisk in the world. But how were the obelisks built? Many theories have been advanced on the techniques used. The discovery of the great unfinished obelisk in Aswan proved to be a great help. The block, measuring 42 meters by four, would have been, if completed, the largest obelisk in the world. It was never completed due to fractures that occurred when it was removed from the rocks around it. In order to extract the block, the ancient Egyptians got rid of the outermost rocks by heating them up and then cooling them down with water. Once they reached the compact vein, they dug lateral trenches. The block was now ready to be removed. Lifting an obelisk was a very complex feat, especially as there was always the risk of it breaking in half. The first step was to place a granite pedestal on the ground. Two banks were built next to it, which created a sort of funnel. The area between the banks was filled with sand. The obelisk was at this point brought to the bank and placed on the sand, which was then gradually removed. As the sand was taken away, the obelisk was lowered and left to rest on the pedestal. Once it was upright, the banks were removed. The work was over. The obelisk was now standing. I'm especially pleased to be able to say these few words about Heliopolis and its symbols. 
while having the obelisk of the Garden of Boboli in Florence behind me. It wasn't found in Florence, of course, but in Rome. The obelisk was bought by a member of the Medici family and placed in the Medici's Roman villa, which now houses the French Academy. And there it stayed until the Medici's, on leaving Rome, brought this important monument with them and erected it in the gardens of Boboli. The date of this obelisk, the date of its construction, dates back to the reign of Ramses II, whose name and epithets are written at the top of the obelisk, where he is regularly called, loved by the god Artum, lord of Heliopolis. So we can therefore have no doubts about its origin. Other obelisks also originated from Heliopolis. Two twin obelisks, erected by Tutmosi III, ruler from the 18th dynasty and known as Cleopatra's Needles, have since been separated. One has been on the Victoria Embankment in London since 1819, while the other was erected in Central Park in New York in 1881. Another two obelisks, originally erected in front of the Temple of the Sun, can now be found in Rome. Obelisk Flaminio in Piazza del Popolo, built under the reigns of Ramses II and his son Meremta, and one called the Solar Obelisk in Piazza Montecitorio by Sameticus II, pharaoh from the 26th dynasty. Although these monuments are typical of Egypt, it is Rome that actually has the most obelisks as many as 13, removed during the wars. It was mainly Roman emperors and popes who wanted them in the Eternal City as a symbol of their power. There are only eight left in Egypt, mainly in Luxor and Karnak. The sun was such an important part of ancient Egyptian culture that it was linked to many different aspects of nature. Ra, in its earthly manifestations was reincarnated in many animals. The most important of them was the phoenix. The phoenix, which in Heliopolis accompanied the cult of the sun, represented resurrection. It is in some way equivalent to the god Osiris, who promised resurrection after death. Sometimes Heliopolis would be visited by the phoenix, its sacred bird, which would land on the Benben stone, shaped as a pyramid, venerated in the temple of the phoenix since the very earliest dynasties. It would seem that it was actually its shape that inspired the pyramids and the obelisk's pointed tip. This stone was so sacred and its religious importance so great that the priests of Heliopolis brought it close to the hill created by Nun, the primordial ocean, and on which Atum, the creator of the universe, gave life to the other divinities of the Ennead. The origin of the stone remains a mystery. According to some legends, the original stone was a meteorite fallen to earth. Is this a fabrication aimed at attaching a holy aspect to this legend or a real story? Heliopolis had already reached the epitome of its glory more than 4,500 years ago, during the Old Kingdom. But what did visitors see when entering for the first time? It is a place of intelligence, the first university of Earth. Society was rigidly structured. The priests were in charge and had almost unlimited powers. In addition to carrying out the cult, the priests of Heliopolis were astronomers, responsible for tracking the movements of the celestial bodies and keeping the festival calendar. The high priest of Heliopolis would have been a member of the high elite, highly esteemed for his skills and responsibilities. Many temples dedicated to the divinities were built in Heliopolis. This is why the city must have grown so big. The great quality of the few monuments that have survived also provide us with the image of an extraordinarily beautiful city. A kilometer from the obelisk of Senesret I, we find a column found amongst the houses in 1980. 
The inscriptions and hieroglyphics on the shaft provide us with important information. The column belonged to a temple erected by Merenta, successor of Ramses II. On it, there are a series of numbers showing how many foreigners there were at the time of the pharaoh's reign. The scenes, which some experts believe represent the Jews fleeing from Egypt, are also of great interest. Little over a year ago, and even here by accident, the remains of a temple complex were discovered, which according to experts was as big as the one in Luxor and Karnak, and just as important. The most amazing thing that we found first evidence of a temple dated to the reign of Akhenaten, the name of Akhenaten written in hieroglyphic and also his beautiful wife Nefertiti, her name was written. And a, a piece of a stone, we call it Talatat, and Talatat in Arabic means three. And this is the style of the blocks of the construction of the temple of Akhenaten. And this can prove that Akhenaten did not only build the temples in Amarna, as many people thought before, but he built temples everywhere. One of the most important area, he built his temple on the area uh, of the spot of the sun god. He wanted to show that Aton, the god behind the sun, is the most important one. The second temple that built here was actually of Ramses II. And this is the large temple that we found uh, mainly the plan of the temple. And we found this beautiful seated statue that has a cartouche of Ramses II. And in the top, you can see the leopard skin to show that Ramses II built this temple for him as a high priest for the worship of the sun god. Homage to you when you rise on your horizon as Ra, resting on truth. You sail over heaven, and every face sees you as you travel, hidden from their faces. You show yourself in the morning and in the evening, every day. It's not difficult to make surprising discoveries in the suburbs of Cairo as is the case with one of the most beautiful tombs discovered in recent years, which was uncovered totally by accident. It belonged to a person, his name is Banahsi, and this person was Nubian, because you know, the Nubian ruled Egypt in Dynasty 25, one dynasty before the period of this tomb, because this tomb is dated to Dynasty 26 in the reign of a king called Pismatic, and his name is written hieroglyphic as uh, Nefer Ibra. And this tomb, it's a small, but it has part of the Book of the Dead. The book can explain the trip to the afterlife. We can see in many scenes here, Khepir, the beetle, inside the sun disk, representing the sun god and leaded by Benahsi and the god Tof and the god Rahurakhti in a boat. They go for the quest of immortality. But the most beautiful place and the most beautiful scene is the scene on the ceiling of the goddess Nut the goddess of the sky. She's holding the sky on her hand. Every piece of inscription, the color, the hieroglyphic, it tells us the story of the quest of immortality. Nut is the Egyptian goddess of birth and she who greets the dead. Sister of Geb, god of the earth, Nut is the goddess of the sky. The Egyptians depict her in an arched position above her husband, separated from him by the void, Shu. She is the mother of all the stars, and according to myth, she gives birth to them every evening, to then eat them up the next morning. 
The position the goddess takes symbolizes her power over the sun and the moon. She is often represented in the same way over sarcophagi, which in turn symbolize the belly of Nut. The deceased was supposed to pass through Nut's body to be born again. An ancient city, one of the biggest and most important in the whole of Egyptian history, is now totally hidden under the uncontrolled expansion of Cairo's suburbs. This makes it very difficult to excavate in the search for any treasures that the ground still holds. You know, this is the most difficult excavation that anyone can do. We call it salvage archaeology. Just recently, we discovered a tomb under a house. We need to take the tomb out. We do not want to destroy the house. We have to save the people here. Look, beside this temple, there is five or six floors, buildings. Then underneath all these houses, there is many treasures hidden underneath. We have to save the treasures, but also we have to save the people. This is the most difficult excavation, but the most exciting one, because you reveal every day evidence to reconstruct history from the same area, the center of the sun god, Ra. <laughs>